Go on. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, this is like a, like a traditional uh, uh, clinic. What I mean with that is, by the time you get Sunday, you see the attendance going down, 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 down. If you've ever been to the ABCA, you go out there and on a Sunday morning, there's some co uh, the coaches are left already, and 80% of the rest of the coaches are still in bed, sleeping out because of the party they had on Saturday night. So this is the same, same thing like all clinics. By the time it gets Sunday, the attendance goes down. So, uh, what I know is that uh, people who are not going to be here, they're going to regret they did because in Philadelphia positioning, everywhere we where you go in the world. It uh, doesn't matter which level, it's youth, it's senior, everything in between. You see so many mistakes of uh, how they play their position. Uh, I got this picture, and nowadays, if you, if you, if you watch uh, if you watch in the major league, whatever, yeah, we got the first baseman, we got the second baseman, we got the shortstop, we got the uh, third baseman. They play some kind of a shift, okay? I'm not going to talk about those type of things today. I'm going to talk about the basic infield out the position. What's the basic uh, position you have to be in? What's going to be our standard rules where we want to defend the opponents? Okay? Basic positioning. Basic positioning has the goal to make an out and defend against all possible bases. So this is going to be my philosophy of all defensive plays, okay? But then, if, if you want to come to this situation, I want my infield to play as deep as possible. I want to defend the center of the field. And of course, with a runner on third base or second base, and third base, infield stays back until the tying or winning run, or the run that will create the biggest lead for the opposing team, except with two outs. What I mean with that is, I keep my infield playing back till the moment that the tying run, the winning run, or, and that's an important one too, the run that will create the big lead for the opposing team. For example, we're facing a pitcher that has an ERA below zero. What could be, uh, the, the guy uh, that uh, Marlo was uh, uh, talking about yesterday, Cordemus, uh, we, we faced him like two, uh, we faced him uh, two times this year. What would be, he has an ERA the last couple of years, 0 0.8, 0 0.4, 0 0.9. What would be, what would be the lead that will create uh, two, a two big lead for the opposing team? Yeah, if you do nothing, that number three run is going to kill us. So you have, to, you have to know on the other side who's on the mark. Okay? So there's no standard rule It's going like, okay, if we're five nothing behind, okay, we're still going to play there or by the time we get seven, eight to nothing, now we're going to play in because we don't want to get killed in seven innings. Okay? So it depends on the opposing pitching and the opposing pitching staff, for example, if you play a three-game set, and uh, first two games, the opposing team had to go very deep into the bullpen. You know that third game, they don't have anybody or less pitching left. You have to take that in consideration. What are you going to do? How are you going to uh, defend? Basic positioning for the first baseman. First baseman, basic. Place eight steps away from the back and eight strikes deep. For example, this, this is first base. It's going to be eight steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's going to be right around this place right here and eight steps back. That's my basic position for my first base. Where do we see every first baseman play? I'm the first baseman. I'm playing first base. If that ball hits to the short, I'll take one step, boom, and catch that baseball. I don't want to have that kind of first baseman. I don't have nothing. As a team, I don't have anything about a first baseman like that. If I see first baseman in second inning playing like two steps off the line, right, he will say, hey, 
that those guys are not going to hit that ball next to me. No, they won't. But we'll, we'll give it up like five, six, seven hits in between the first and second baseman. Or that second baseman goes like, this guy's playing way over there. Now I have to shift this way. Now we create a big hole in the, in the middle of the infield. So we take eight normal steps. Just a regular thing if you walk in a mall or whatever. Just like eight steps, eight, and eight back. That's your standard basic position for the first baseman. Another responsibility for the first baseman is stay the bunt away. When runners show the tendency to bunt to the right side of the infield, the first baseman may reduce the depth on the best bunters, the first baseman wants to show bunt coverage and retreat to the pitch. If we have guys, and this we're not talking about sack bunts, we're talking about guys who can drag bunt, push bunt, take the ball first base, let it take it with him. Okay, we're talking about these situations. If you know that this guy, we're eight steps off the line, we're eight steps back. Now all of a sudden this guy comes up and you no, know, he likes to burn. Okay. He likes it better, so we make an adjustment. That's why I say basic. Okay? Make an adjustment, so you're, you're cheating a little bit, you're coming in a little bit. For the second baseman, second baseman, basic. Six steps from the back and 16 steps back. So if uh, this is second base right here, it's going to be a straight line to a first base. One, two, three, four, five, six. And now we're going back. Back is not like that. So it's regular. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, fifteen, sixteen back. That's going to be our basic positioning for the second baseman. So it's six, sixteen. First baseman, eight, eight. Double play depth. Double play then, it's four steps from the base and 14 deep. Okay, so right now on double play position, we're going to sneak a little bit in and we're going to sneak a little bit over towards the back. Sacrifice button with a run on second base. Walking four steps to shorten the distance to first base, moving and over to first base as the ball is bunted. Be sure to cover the push button. What I mean by that is, in a bunt situation, I want my second baseman to cheat a little bit. So if this is his normal depth, I want him to cheat in a little bit right here. Now, from that position, if this guy is going to burn, you see 80, 75, 80% of the second baseman's first reaction is going like the first base. No, the second baseman's first reaction has to be in, Toward the infield and then go over. Why would we do that? Why would we go in and then go over? Push button. What else? Slash. Of course. If we, if my second baseman gives up from the first step, bunt, you can go to first base. Right now, especially these days, they're putting the uh, the uh, bunt. They see the infield moving. Turn back. The slash it. You're giving up the entire middle of the infield. Okay? So first in, then over. Short stops. Short stops. It's going to be eight steps. It's going to explode in a minute? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, eight steps from the back, 16 back. Okay? That's going to be the basic position for the short stop. Here we go. Double play then. Six step off the back, 12 strides back off the baseline. <coughs> what I mean with that, guys, for shortstop, second base, we don't have to gonna be every single time go one, two, three, four, five, and, and go back. No. They have to measure it out on practice, and by the time they do it, they see it and they have to be, they have to create their own visual angle, of course, where they have to be. On sack bunts, run on first base, move in as the hitter shows bunt, do not move toward the base until the ball is bunted. Same thing as the second baseman. 
we want to defend the uh, middle of the infield. Runner on second base or first and second load. Hold the runner on second base in the normal fashion. Okay? Just hold him in a normal fashion. Third baseman. Third baseman is the same thing as a first baseman. Eight steps off the line, eight steps deep. Double play depth, move in and over two steps. So it's going to be two steps in, two steps over, right there. Okay? If we watch if we watch games and I'm in the stands or I'm watching the opposing team, so that two steps over to the hole. Moving, moving, and over two strikes. Yeah, a little bit in the hole. Oh, hole. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in the hole third, you mean the hole between, yeah, yeah. Short, short third. and third, yeah, of course. If I'm in the stands and I watch other teams play, it doesn't matter. I've seen like uh, cadet championships, I've seen junior championships, I see uh, world baseball, I see world baseball classic. I'm not mentioning the uh, MLB. But in all those games, you see the same thing. You see a wide, an ocean, an ocean between the first baseman and the third baseman because they play too close against the line. Yeah, but if, if one hits next to the line, yeah, you got to tip your head. You got to play the percentage. Like Jim said, baseball is a game of percentages. You got to play them. Okay? And you got to play the basic situation till that guy at the plate tells us we have to make an adjustment. Okay? Bum hit situation. Five strikes from, uh, from the back and two strikes inside the baseline. What I mean with that, bum hit situation, if there's a guy on, uh, in the box who likes to drag bump and lay the bump down the third base, it doesn't matter if it's a righty or a lefty. Okay, the speedy guys, the lead off hitters, the number nine hitters, all those kind of things, or in uh, Morrow's case, it's number three hitter. Uh, so those guys, you have to make the adjustment, okay? Sack bumps. Use the same positioning as, as a situation where we're going to guard against the uh, bug hit, against the uh, drag bug. Outfielders. Left field. What I mean with ex extended line first and second, what I mean with that, and I'm going to take this one right here. second and third, and the center fielder plays slightly to the pull side of the hitter to provide a view of the pitch to the plate. Center fielder can be played straight center field because, of course, there's a pitcher in between and he doesn't give a good view. So we play him uh, slightly to the pull side of the hitter. With the righty, he's playing a little bit more, a couple steps to the left field. And uh, with the left hand, he plays, uh, excuse me, yeah, left field, and with the uh, left hand, he plays a couple steps to the right field side. Same thing, basically. Up to the moment, they prove us we have to make an adjustment. Depth of the outfielders. Ninety percent of the teams I see, I see their outfielders play way too deep. One of my offers played to deep, and I said, what are you doing? Yeah, but if, but if he hits the ball over my head, and I say, like, you have to say, good swing, big guy. So he might have, 
hit one ball over your head the entire game, it's going to be six, seven balls before your feet that drop before you, and we can't make the play. Now, unfortunately, uh, I might have, uh, might have the uh, best outfield for next year that I ever played together in, uh, on the European uh, team, defensive-wise, so, uh, and also speedy-wise. So play them in. Don't play them too deep. 80% of the balls will drop in front of you as it hits. 80%. Okay. Ten percent of the ball, if you play deep, you're perfect for ten percent of the balls hit, to, hit into the outfield. Ten percent if your outfield's playing too deep. So you're only you're lined up to catch ten percent of the baseballs hitting you. Ten percent of the balls are over the head. So actually, if we're playing deep, we can cover twenty percent of all balls hit in the outfield. Same thing where Jim had the introduction for me. He said percentage-wise, same thing. It proves it right here. Outfielders can be afraid for that one ball that will hit, uh, will be hit over his head. But 80% of the balls will drop in front of him. Depth is functional of several factors. How deep do we have to play? Okay. First of all, the hitter will dictate us. What is his power? Is he a power guy or is he the leadoff guy? Such a guy. He's like that. A speedy guy, right on top of the guy, and you see the, those outfields go like that. They're still standing out there. You gotta make the adjustment. Wind, wind will dictate how deep you can play. I had a, I had, we had a game this year that one of my, my first baseman, the first baseman hit a pop up to the second baseman. And I was like, shit, take a good pitch to drive, man. Don't give yourself another way. Now all of a sudden, that ball bounced off the wall. Because this wind was like, almost looked like a hurricane. And it went, at that time, you can't play like regular depth. You can't play shallow. You got to make the adjustment. Because every ball hit in the, in, the, uh, in the air will be carried. Or if that big wind is blowing in, you better make the adjustment. The air. Okay, if you play in Colorado or you play in uh, in Brussels, it will <laughs> dictate where you have to play. Depth of the outfield fence. Right now, what are people going to say? What are people going to do? I play like whatever, 10, 20 steps off the uh, of the fence on the normal field. But this is like a short field, okay? This is short field, so better be playing back. No. If that's a short field, we're going to adjust and we're going to play even more shallow. Because I know that my outfielders can cover like 20, 25 meters behind them. Well, if that fence is 20 meters shorter, I want them to play 20 meters even shorter the whole play because I know they can they can't cover 20 to 25 <coughs> meters behind them. So the outfield fence will, uh, will be a factor to uh, play even more shallow than we used to be, or used to do. The ability of the fielders to go back on fly balls. If I have an outfielder who is bad at going back on fly balls, first of all, it's my opportunity and it's my uh, my job, my job to teach him how to go back and fly balls the proper way. But of course, you get great athletes, you get good athletes, and you get the rest of your athletes that are less talented, less uh, athletic. They, they don't have as much athleticism as the other guys. But that might be the guy you play a little bit more deep than another kid. Normally, here has less power to the opposite side. Normally, we heard Jim talk about Manny Ramirez, okay, yesterday, that he drives the ball the other way, the A-Ross, they hit it over to the right side, and so on, and so on. But the, normally, the normal hitters, what we have to deal with in Europe, has less power to the opposite side. What I mean with that is the right field. The right field has to play at least four steps more in 
to prevent that ball bouncing in front of our feet. And of course, the left fielder has to do that first the left hand hitter. General considerations. First of all, movement from the basic positions are made after consideration of the following factors. Pitcher and a particular pitch is throwing. We know how we're going to pitch certain hitters. We know if we if we're going to pitch this guy, okay, the other team, Jim is the big, the big guy on the other team. And we know, hey, we have to bust him in all day long. We've got to bust him in all day long. Okay? If we're busting him in, we have to play it the right way. We have to adjust in the infield or make an adjustment in the outfield. If we're busting him in, then we're going to expect that he's going to hit about the left side of the infield as a right-handed hit or the left side of the outfield. Okay? So what I mean with that, if you make a little shift, you're not going to pitch him away. So you have to know, as your infield, your outfield, has to know your game plan, how you're going to pitch those guys before the game, not during the game. Not the shortstop going like fastball, breaking ball, but all of a sudden this kid is right here, and all of a sudden he sees that shortstop on a fastball moving a little bit that way, and on a breaking ball moving that way. So now all of a sudden you can, the pitcher can go like this, it's the same thing, fastball, here it is. Okay? So you have to know if we're going to pitch that guy way, way, way on the off-speed off speed pitch. you got to know what this guy is up. Okay, make an adjustment. We're going to play him out here. We're going to play him on the other side. Hitter's tendencies. Okay? If you know that this guy pulls the baseball every single time, and he has like, uh, the last couple of years, he got like 50 hits against us, and from those 50 were 12 next to the uh, third baseline, right here, next to the third baseline, I don't want my uh, third baseman eight steps off the back and eight steps back. I want him to make an adjustment because this guy proved that he's going to hit the baseball right there. Field conditions, same thing like uh, like we were talking yesterday about base running. Okay, I started to say well, I want my infield back, but if the field we're playing on is a very slow infield because of the grass isn't cut, the, the right way it has to be done, or whatever other reasons. I have to move my head. Guys, listen up. We can't, we can't afford ourselves to play back today. We've got to move in a little bit. Or, hey guys, listen up. This is a very speedy infield. You better, you better be ready. You might get an extra step back if you can, because the field will dictate what's going to happen. And of course, the count of the hitter. Okay? It's a, it's a two strike approach, and this guy really takes a two strike approach. And the only thing you want to do is get that ball in the infield as a number one hitter, as a lead up guy, just try to put the ball in the infield and, and try to run it out or the number nine hitter, whatever. Okay? Make the adjustment. Fielder's arm and strength. Okay, I want to play my infield deep. Uh, third baseman, eight steps off the line, eight steps back. All of a sudden, he gets the ball, he feels the ball. He, Wow. Yeah, you can't try to get the pitcher as a relay guy and throw the ball first base, but that won't work. Okay? So, if you have, if you have athletes, they have, are less talented, arm strength wise, yeah, you've got to make an adjustment. You've got to play in a little bit, or you've got to play over a little bit, or whatever works for that. And that's the main thing. Every clinic you go to, and also this one right here, you get, we're loaded with a ton of information. A ton of information. And that's the thing that Jim was telling you about yesterday. It's like a toolbox. You put all the tools in there. And your toolbox, you have to try to get that toolbox as big as you can. But every tool in there won't work for each individual player you have. You might have one tool for this guy. You might have one tool for that guy. You might have one tool for that guy. Guys, listen up. There's not one way to do it. Okay? It might be one way for this guy, it might be one way for the other guy. Okay? So, we can't make robots, and, 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 and a lot of coaches sometimes are trying to make robots out of our players, and we can't do that. And of course, 
doesn't mean if it's number six, it's the less important. Uh, but the came situation, of course, will dictate what's going to happen. It's later in the game. It's early in the game. It's tight ball game. It's tender run ball game. We're winning 10 to nothing. We're losing 10 to nothing. Hopefully that doesn't uh, happen a lot, but it could be. It's once in a while. Late inning in a close ball game. And now all coaches say, hey, Steve, late inning, uh, late inning close ball game. I want to defend the lights. Through? Yeah. And my, uh, how you call it? And my, uh, I'm the same page of that thing. Yes and no. Why? I'm going to tell you in a minute. First of all, my philosophy is positioning stays the same unless a double will score, uh, will uh, change the score dramatically. It's a close ball game. For example, we're leading 42. Will a double have a big influence on the score? No, no really. Not for me at that time. So why would you stay at your normal, why, why would I let my players stay at the normal position? Why would I stay, why would I keep my runners on the same position they normally do? They usually do face-to-face. I don't understand this. <laughs> you, you talk to the defender to keep the same pace because they used to be at the same pace. They used to be in the same position. Yeah, used to be, yeah, used to be on the same position. Yeah, no, not really. The thing is, where did I start off my story today? Percentages and what? What do I want to defend? The center of the field. Where are like most of the hits hit? The center of the field. <coughs> okay. So if I put my guys on the line, playing the lines, now all of a sudden. A routine ground ball in the hole will give them a free pass to first base. So I keep on playing the percentages. I keep on going with my basic rule. Okay? Unless this guy is really a pole guy and he once in a while he really hacks one next to the line, then I'm not going to say, like, hey, we've got to stay basic and no. Then I make the adjustment. I move my third baseman over. But otherwise, if I have to move him over, I shoot him because he has to know with himself this guy's a poor guy. I get to move over a little bit. Late in the game, we try to keep an important run off second base. I think that's as clear as it can be. Okay? Keep him on first base, keep the double play in order, and get uh, don't get him into a scoring position. For example, get a one run lead, no outs or one out, first and third. A uh, base play against the line, left and right field, four steps back and closer to the line. That could be a possibility. That would be like all coaches would be would do. That's like the thing there. Most of the coaches are doing these days. Why? A hit is a shape, but an extra base hit is crucial. Okay. Run on first and third base hit. That's great. He gives that, uh, he has that run right now. We get runners on. First and second. Okay. If I didn't play the lines, double, could have caused a runner on third, uh, second and third. Scored two runs in scoring position. Personally, personally, I don't agree on that. And I started a little earlier on that story. I think you can make it easy on you. Opponent to hit bases, that dribbler that goes through the infield and give an uh, extra base. What I do is, with no odds, I play my basic position. Your basic position, with no odds. With one out, I move him in and, and over two steps, my quarters. Two outs, I want them to be on the line. Why that? With two outs, I don't want to get, have a guy from, with two outs. I don't want to have, give him a free pass to second base on the, on the regular ground ball next to the line. Okay? If I'm going to give him a base hit, a dribbler in between me and the shortstop, I don't care. Because these guys are first base. They need two extra hits 
to score them, or they need a home or, or uh, a bomb against the wall to score this guy. So what my philosophy is no outs, regular, two outs, uh, excuse me, one out, two steps over, and three outs, uh, excuse me, two outs, three outs will be great, uh, two outs will play the line. Only with headers who can pull the ball to the foul line. Questions? When you move your corners to the uh, lines, do you adjust your second shortstop sure stop any? Well, at that time, regarding the hitter, okay, if this guy is really a pull guy, of course they're going to move over. Um, it's most of the time they will, of course. Most of the guys they will make a slight adjustment. They they also are going to create a little bit more angle right there, but. It's more like a feeling at that time. It's not like a standard thing right here. It's depending on who's pitching for me, how we pitching this guy, uh, what did he do during the game, what does his numbers tell me, and all the kind of stuff. Uh, especially not, not, not his numbers, but his, uh, the hitting chart tells me and how we're going to play this guy uh, up to me at that time. Guys, charting. And uh, I know that a lot of you guys are keeping chart. Where did he hit? Where did he hit? You put a picture on that, and he's hitting that, and he's hitting that, and he's hitting that. And that picture is right there, and he's doing the stuff and great. But what do you do with it? What do you do with all that information? After the game, you put it in your, uh, in your map, and it's going with you. And the next game, you come out against that same team, you take a, book, a new paper, a new sheet, and you're here, you're not pitching there, you're going. You have to put everything on one sheet, and you get a key. It's got to be next to you in the dugout. This guy's hitting, Ooh. he has a tendency to hit that way, that way, that way, that way. It's got to be next to you. You got to see it. You got to visualize it every time again. If you see, if you see Major League Baseball, you see if you saw the World Series, every single inning that they, 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 they got, or uh, Girardi, or uh, the other guy, Phil Isner. Yeah. Manual. You got manual. They go up there and they go there. Just check it out. Okay, that's it. You got, you got to do something with it. You can't just, uh, before the game, go through, okay, I know. You got to keep it with you. If you want other stuff, put it on the dugout. Get some uh, tape, some, uh, tape out, put it on the... Use it. Use the stuff you create. And you have to use it. It's not because it's major league they have to do it, or it's international ball they have to do it. You have to do it on every level if you want to improve. If you want to improve, you got to make the next step to the next level to be a better bottler. Okay? Any more questions? You know, one thing I want to point out, and we talk about playing that outfield in close, and I I don't care if I'm working with national teams or clubs when I travel around the last 19 years. I watch coaches hit fungos, and probably 19 out of 20 fungos they hit are in front of the outfielders that are taking the fungos. And you've got to bring that guy in and say, if, if we're not going back four out of five times, or they're practicing too deep. It's fine to teach them, but unless you're making them practice, turn their back and run, they're not going to do it in the game. They'll just creep back, creep back, and pretty soon you look around, what? Come on, join us. But you, that's your job. The second thing is you better learn to hit fungos. If you can't hit fungos, you can't do a good job of coaching. I don't care if it's ground balls so that you can work a guy left, right. You know, you put that backspin model I talked about, that's not easy. Uh, and I know uh, I'm in a situation where I don't really think but play golf and watch TV, and then all of a sudden I go to go to Europe and I gotta start spend six weeks hitting bungos, it's pretty ugly to start with. I'm hitting those three hoppers, you know, and instead of getting something skidding. Same with the outfield. You you've got to be able to hit line drives, not just the fly ball that they come trucking in on. And so you gotta prepare them for how you're gonna play them. The other thing that I like about bunch in the middle is do you want your shortstop going in the hole and making this play, or do you want the third baseman come across making this play? You know that. Think about well, let's cover things. 
the last thing that I heard, and I, I think I heard it last clinic, it's the best verbal uh, sign that, or verbal encouragement that a center fielder can give his, his wingman. Because usually your center fielder's uh, probably your second best athlete. He, he has the best arm, best coverage, and you got this left fielder over there that's in there because he's hitting pretty good, but it may be a little shaky. I know, I, I played left field, that's me. <laughs> okay. Center, the, this coach said, I tell, tell the center fielder to tell the left fielder, hey, you got the line, I got the alley. All of a sudden, I'm over here and left, I don't have to worry about this and this, because he can't. Well, most likely he can't. So he thinks, okay, I'm getting off there, I'm leaving a gap, but I don't have to worry so much about the outcome when we catch this, but anything more than 30% towards the center fielder, okay, he's got it. And if that center fielder can tell his wingman, hey, I got the alleys, you make sure. Now, that doesn't mean this guy moves over on the line. Don't let him do that. But he can get a little further off if he knows that's his main responsibility. As like Jim said, you got you got to learn to use the fungo properly. But don't misunderstand, Jim, on this one, that you the main thing you practice outfielders is not with a fungo. Of course, you got to give them fungos, but working on the technique, you're not going to do that with a fungo. You're just going to do that by throwing football passes and all that kind of stuff. Because then you can throw it where you want. They can work on their drop steps, whatever you want to call it, or they just they just difference. And but don't misunderstand. Of course, they need to do uh, get uh, see uh, balls off the fungo, Of course, but what is the best time for your outfielders to work on something? When is the best time to do that? Batting practice. Batting practice. I don't want. I want all my players during BP. I want them on my on their positions at least for a couple batters. I want that infielder getting extra ground balls. I want that infielder getting ready, that one, two, boom, right here by the, by the time that ball is in the zone. This guy swings and I want them to react, okay? They don't have to be, you have 45 minutes BP, I don't want, my third base, don't have to be on third base for 45 minutes for a half an hour if he hits for 15 minutes, okay? If he goes like one round, he takes some extra ground balls or whatever. If he has enough, he'll decide himself or and he's, when he's catching it, I want him to throw first base. I got a pitcher covering out there or whatever. I don't care who it is. Or I want him to be right here boom, and turn that double play. Why not? And if he has enough, he moves back to the outfield and he can hang out with another guy right there, shy. Perfect. But I want my outfielders out there, and I want them on every single baseball to do their reaction. And all my pitchers are out there. But the thing is, my pitchers know Hey, that's the outfielder. Get out of the way. And if that ball is hit, I'm right there. I don't want that pitcher chasing, chasing. The only thing that can happen, he can't hit in the head by the ball. <laughs> can't say the type of thing. But I want that outfielder, uh, that outfielder working on something. Okay, the outfielder just went that way, and he's coming back right now. The fly ball is this way. My pitcher can't catch him. Not only on fly balls, also on ground balls. Okay. Let your outfielders put something in their own head. Okay, right now, run on second base. Run on second base, okay, right there. Brown ball, huh? come in, scoop, and just simulate the throw to home plate. Or simulate, they have to circle the baseball and get ready to throw third, third base. Or to second base, and throw the ball back into the uh, shagger. I have a question. Um, when you get two outs, um, I like to add my uh, outfielders, but it would be easier to avoid a double. What mm -hmm. do you think about that? Yeah, of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Of course. No, but in, in certain situations, no doubles, you play no doubles. You, you sign to your outfielders, no doubles. That's the same thing. Of course, you play a little bit deeper because now that ball over the head that will the double will uh, increase. Uh, it's a very important uh, run at that uh, particular moment. So my outfield is going to play no doubles, they play backwards, of course, yeah. Of course. That outfield positioning closer to the infield makes a difference too on the decision the third base coach has to make. Your basic rule on, on normal single, runner on second, is if 
the outfielder catches the ball before the runner touches third, you stop him. If the runner touches third before the outfielder catches the ball, you send him. If it's bang, bang, how's the arm, how's the foot speed, and the judgment call. And if we're playing shallow and we go get the ball, it doesn't matter if I have an average or below average arm. Yeah, I had a below average arm, so I know this. If I get rid of the ball, that stops the runner. Okay, so not only does it help <laughs> catch more balls, it also reduces the number of bases the offense is going to get. That's it, and it's the same thing. It's not only on the on the decision that the third baseman has to make, but also on a regular base hit. We were talking about base running yesterday. What do I want my runners to do by the time that ball gets in the outfield? Think what? Think double. Think double. Double. Think second base. Well, if that outfield is playing in, that outfield is quick to that baseball, that runner don't have to think second base, second base, second base, because he's going to be good. Plus, it will reduce his amount of turn he can take. It's going to be a less aggressive turn, because the outfield is just closer to them, it's shorter to throw and everything else. So, it gives you so much advantages uh, to manage the game. Okay, anywhere else? Yeah, just want to or ask, other situations you come yeah. up with, I don't care. I just want to ask, what do you think about making charts when you come to the tournaments? You know, people used to make all those hitting charts. I see that, you know, I, I personally don't do it. If I go to the tournament, I, I'm coming to stopwatch. I just want to see, you know, how the catch is going. Well, tournament, tournament is something it's different. Kind of, you know, they, I just talked to the people, so they said, like, well, we're doing charts, we're going to decide how we're going to position our players during the game, based well, on what you see in one game, maybe, sometimes. You know, so. Yeah, but the thing is, first of all, I'm, I like to use charts, but it has to be representable. One. What I mean with that, if we sell one game, it's not representable. Because we saw a long game, they were facing a lefty and I'm throwing a right. Okay? Or I saw them, they were facing an ex major league from 90, 91, 92. My guy is throwing 79. It's not representable. Okay? But, for example, in my league, I got stats from all over the years, and I got like 50, 60, 70, 100, 150 something ABs on the chart. That's presentable. <laughs> now you can see tendencies. Okay? But if you go to tournaments and you be having like one or two games, it might be it might be not bad just to take a look at it and you know that this guy for me at that time it's better to know, okay, I know that, that guy likes to drag it. I know that, that guy likes to hit and run. I like to that guy likes to run. That's more valuable information at that time for me than that. He has like, yeah, two base hits in left field and struck out twice. I don't have a lot with that. Because who was throwing? How was he throwing? They want to throw him outside. This guy missed his spot twice. He hit a base hit on, on two bad pitches. That is not representable for that, uh, that particular moment. How about positions? Kill of positions. Well, that's <laughs> yet another hour. Uh, kill of positions is a completely different thing. First of all, First of all, the main goal with cutoff positions, and, 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 and it's been covered, uh, Jim covered it. We need a little bit of cut cut tomorrow. Just a slide for it. Uh, Halfway or? Yeah. But what I mean with uh, cutoffs is like, first of all, first of all, the main rule about cutoffs is why is a cutoff for? What's, what's, what's the goal of a cutoff? Get the ball back in the infield? To prevent the extra base. Cut it off. Keep the guys Cut the ball off and talk to another base. Cut off. Cut the ball off. Hold it. Relay it. Or cut it off and throw it to another base. That's the goal of, of a cutoff man. Okay? So a cutoff man, 95% of the times, is located in the infield. Okay, you get double cuts and all kinds of stuff. That's something completely different. But the cutoff man, the thing he has to do is get a cutoff throw, get to go to second, get a cutoff the throw, throw a third, or you get a really a throw, you won't play. That's a cutoff. And first baseman, third baseman, 
for a regular play run a second base base hit, they're located in the infield. But cutoffs, it's cutoffs you have to practice. And practice cutoffs is not only like being on the line and work on their footwork and get that throw going. Okay? Cutoffs is really get your positioning out, get your pitchers with a helmet, let them do the conditioning while they run the bases, and the coach is hitting fun goals, and you work on these situations and put a run on that bag and you try to score, you got to use coaches, sending him, holding him. It's got to be game wide speed. Yeah, but my uh, outfielders. After three, four throws, they're done, and I got only three outfielders. So if three th throws, they're done. Can we, I can uh, practice nine times on cutoffs. That would be a solution. Outfielders are done. Outfielders going to run. You just put a pitching machine out the center field today, and the only thing you do is you, you shoot the ball right there, and you work. You work on um, cutoffs, communication wise. Okay? You still catch it. It's not field throwing, or you use that pitching machine shooting a baseball. You still has to be communication. <coughs> because that's the main thing communication. Short, uh, the uh, catcher still has to say, step right, you're okay, you're good, you're good. Cut two, 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 two. Boom. So it doesn't matter if you're not field throwing or you get that pitching machine uh, shooting baseballs. You can you can you can use that one. So that's another way you can you can you you would be able to uh, to practice that indoors. That's the way you practice it indoors. Communication is the most important thing about it. Well, every uh, well I want I want they have other systems for cutoffs. I want to talk to all those coaches because I don't know a lot of different systems. The thing is, the thing is, don't get, don't get too fancy. Do very basic, very basic. Run around second base, base hit, ball in left field, ball left field, third base is going to be the cut. Center field, right field is going to be the first base. The cut of men are going to be in the infield. Only special thing is out center field. I want my second baseman before the mound, not behind the mound, because that ball can bounce off the mound. So I want him to be with the uh, with the uh, mound, pitcher's mound in his back. I want my first baseman right there. That's basic. That's a basic thing. Okay. To third base, it's going to be the shortstop lining up on the left field, and on the center field and right field. Uh, excuse me. It's going to be the uh, second baseman lining up on the right field, and the other situation is going to be the shortstop. That's going to be that's that's very basic, and that's doesn't matter which book you take or whatever. And if you're a coach, they're doing the things other but other ways, better ways, maybe better ways. Well, I like to talk to them because I like to know why it's better. Maybe I can change philosophy. I wish I had shortstop cut off the third hole. Yeah, close the third. No, the shortstop doing everything. Yeah, the second baseman doing anything. Second base is not cut off. The only thing the second baseman comes in is with the ball cut. Shortstop is not doing anything. But you got to practice it. I tell you, the last time I handled the Czech Junior National Team, I, my assistant finally said, he said, he said, Jim, I didn't know you were so religious. I said, what do I've never heard Jesus Christ so many times. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, this, we're walking about the national team, and these kids could not get cutoffs and relays. And I'm thinking, you know, how are we going to get to the good stuff? That we got to get ready for the tournament. And when we're supposed to, we can't get, you know, first base, third base, and kind of looking at each other. You're going to take it or I'm going to take it. And that's basic. I was lucky. I learned cutoffs and relays when I played Little League Baseball. I had a coach that thought that was important. I go to college, and I'm playing with guys that have never learned cutoffs and relays. And we weren't taught it in college. Now, he coach yelled like hell at guys when they weren't in the right place, but he never taught it. So I know there's a wide range of way people do it, but it's important. You teach ball players young about bunt defense, cutoffs, and rundowns so that it's natural and it's not happening. Now, I know that's trouble. In Europe, especially when I first started coming over, there wasn't a lot of history. You had a lot of older players started playing when they were older. But nowadays, 
and this this one right here that would be plenty of room enough to work with your team of cutters and roofers. Because what you do is you put a little ink filled out and you just let them walk through it. Okay? That baseball is hit in left field. Okay. Third baseman, what does he have to do? Okay, you gotta move in there. Okay, what the catcher has to do? Okay, I gotta go like one step from the right, or one step to the right, you're good, right there. Okay, what does the shortstop have to do in this situation? Shortstop, what do you have to do? Oh, I gotta cover third base, otherwise there's nobody there. Okay, second base, what do you have to do? And you just do it on a small infield, you can do it on every, you can, actually, it will be great, especially with the great weather we have. Eh? There's, we got a lot of rain outs, practice, and not like, we practice today. No, you don't have to come. Shit. We have like one or two practice for an hour, half an hour. Because of a little rain, we said no practice. Let them come on. We work on, we work on uh, situations. If it's raining that hard, we can do it inside. Okay? In the clubhouse, we put away a couple tables, we get a couple throw down bases, and we walk through the situations. Or we get the uh, we get a board out and we're thing or the, the fancy thing with the uh, with the uh, with the magnets and you go up to the situations. Let them work. My players know they never have to call me if it's practice or not. Only if there's like a couple foot of snow out there and you can't get on the on the highway or something like that. That's a different story. But otherwise, there's always practice. If the yeah, but the infill is completely covered with water. I don't care. Throw a couple of throw down bases in the after, work in the after. You can always work on something. Especially with our youth, you can only get one or twice a week the chance to practice for an hour, an hour and a half. Take it. Don't you think they have like, for example, two practices, an hour and a half, makes three hours, <coughs> two hour games, five hours a week baseball. We would create better players with five hour baseball in a week. Five hours a day, maybe, yeah, but not five hours a week. So every single situation, we can bring the guys to the ballpark. We have to. And we got to talk baseball, we got to read baseball, and we got to think baseball all the way around. And I got to close up with a thing that I, I told yesterday, the people who were yesterday. And the, uh, I talked talk about that with base running. But uh, it was actually, I, I forgot I put it in the presentation. <laughs> I, I couldn't see one of to play the game of baseball, so they made, gave me a special job that made me an umpire. What I mean with that is not disrespectful to umpires. Guys, listen up. In my entire career, I've never been, as a player, as a coach, as a manager, I've never been thrown out of the ball game. Never. But the thing is, uh, an umpire is a human being. That means that he can make errors. Okay? He can make errors. The same way like my player can make an error and that I can make an error. I made errors this year. I made errors this year, of course. We're human beings. If you don't do anything, you can't do nothing wrong. But the thing is, if we don't have those guys, we're not playing. We're not playing. And the first thing of all, you gotta respect them. Doesn't mean that you can't go chat along with them on a good face. The way I walk with umpires. I had an umpire this year, and in that game, he was so bad. He was so bad. And after the game, he walks up to me and says, Steve, I'm glad you guys won today. He said, because I was so bad, and it was on one side. I said, I didn't want to have for my, uh, I, I didn't want you guys to lose your, your loss on my account. I'm not happy you guys won. He said, I, great, keep my hat for you if you talk that way to me. A week later, I walk up to him uh, before the game. He had our game again. So I ran out to be the first manager. I won't play. I said, listen up. He said, excuse me, but is this your mobile phone? I said, no, why? He said, yeah, I told you a lot. You, you forgot it last week. But why do you think it was my fault? I said, right here, eight missed calls. I said, it must be your phone. Okay, thank you. <laughs>